Welcome to our talk about uh, Denmark and Minecraft, a uh, geosocial experiment, that's the title we gave it, but really it's as much about the technical stuff as what happened in world. So, <coughs> My name is Simon Kockendorf and I'm actually a mathematician, but have been uh, on, at the Danish Geodata Agency for the last six years, working with data analysis and data processing. Yes, and I'm Torbjörn. I work with Simon uh, in a day-to-day -day work. We sit just right next to each other. And I'm a chartered surveyor. Um, really, that's about property and, and all the law about managing uh, properties. Uh, but I work with GIS analysis and, and data analysis at the Geodata AC. Okay. This is what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to go give you an introduction to what the Geodata Agency is uh, and how we fit into the Danish government, then um, what Minecraft is, um, and then how we, we, we went through this project. Um, the Ministry of the Environment, that's uh, basically what it is. We, we deal with everything that has to do with the natural environment or the chemical environment. And we have these agencies within the ministry, and uh, that includes also the coastal authority, uh, who who does the the surveys of the um, of the oceans around us. And we also have uh, an appeal instance for whenever uh, an agency um, uh, restricts or, or puts down a ban on something, people can also appeal that decision. We are in the due data agency, and. Um, we are all about infrastructure. We uh, provide provide this uh, infrastructure for, for for the country, and that is uh, everything from the spatial reference systems. Uh, we define coordinate systems. We uh, we keep track of the geodesy, uh, and we also have the cadaster, which is uh, keeping track of ownership and properties. Uh, and then we have various topographic maps, uh, uh, height data, nautical maps, and and uh, all derived products. Uh, Simon and I, we work with a huge load of data. Very, very, I would not even call it big data, it's beyond that. Uh, and I'll give you a short demo of what it is. Uh, right now we are doing a laser scan of, uh, of the entire country, and that is uh, an airplane collecting points, very dense point cloud. Um, we're talking about four points per square meter. And um, if I just give this a different coloring, you can see that each point is classified with something and we can flip it into 3D. Um, as you can see, this very nice building here, the, I think it's a Gemini building just across the, the harbor. Um, so, so this is the data we are receiving now. We are doing analysis on, we're quality controlling these data and then we are publicizing them to users. Um, the reason why we do this now, if we look back five years ago, we would have to charge for our services or data. That was, you could buy them. But now through this uh, basic data program just launched 1st of January 2013, all of our data is free for everyone to use. Anyone can download these data and use them as they wish. And this is uh, simply to, to obtain these objectives to ensure that the data is reused, to ensure that, that it's feasible to use and that, that the keys are the same, the, the, an address in one database is, is similar to an address in another database, etc. And also there is a desire to, to heighten the quality of these databases. And something everyone understands is money and, and this is the business case. And in 2013 there was a, an expense providing these data, we didn't get any income from these data anymore. Uh, and and soon after we should realize that 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 we are gaining more than than we were by by having these data up for pay now they are for everyone to use and actually i think that we will see that this was a very conservative way of of of, uh, of making the business plan back then um, so for us it means that we no longer have we are not dependent on a fixed income and the the we are also um, obliged to, to provide an early access to data. So um, that goes for these cadastral maps. It goes for our base maps, which we use to make derived products. 
It goes for orthophotos or satellite images that is mostly known as, as in Google Earth or Bing Maps, etc. We also have the derived topographic maps where we make them more pretty um, and add place names and coloring schemes, etc. And then we have the height data. All of this is today available for free. You can make an account and you just have to register with an email and a password and you can download everything. I'll give you some examples of how this is um, worked out in, in real life. This demo here is uh, a small company. They started up the same date that these data was given free, and that is basically their business case is to make services on top of these data. Um, and um, this one here is, is made on, on preliminary data. We, 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 we put these images up for download. They downloaded them and made this very nice uh, 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 shaded relief of, uh, of the data. And you can see actually when you remove the, the laser scanner shoots down through the, the forest canopy so you can see what happens underneath as well. It's, it's, it is uh, unprecedented, pres unprecedented for, for, an, for a country to, to provide this amount at this level of detail uh, for free. Um, they actually won a prize for this implementation of, uh, of this map, the company here. Um, and then another example from the public sector is the uh, Ministry of Taxation. They, uh, uh, as part of this program, they came, became aware that we had this huge trunk of data and asked us, uh, could we find houses which had a view to the ocean? Because houses with a view to the ocean are worth more than houses without. So, so could you tell us where they are? And, and Using these data over here, it's actually a, a very simple analysis to make uh, to, to these uh, view analysis. So, so what is meant for us uh, in very much a higher data awareness, data is free, focus on quality, and an increased demand. And now to Minecraft. <coughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Minecraft is. You probably already know it, at least if you have kids. Uh, it's a hugely popular 3D sandbox game, meaning that you can pretty much do everything you want. There are no rules. You can roam around and build freely. Um, so it's about placing blocks, breaking blocks. Everything is built up of blocks. There are also monsters in survival mode, but that's not really relevant to us. <coughs> Minecraft is developed by a Swedish company called Mojang, and uh, Mojang is now owned by Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. So just to show you a little bit about how big Minecraft is, one of the developers recently tweeted some graphs showing the concurrent player count. I think this is just on the PC platform, and at an, any given point in time, there are, is about one million players online at the same time. And the peak is, is a bit higher. So that's a lot of people playing Minecraft. When you um, start up Minecraft, it will generate a terrain for you out of blocks. And it's a pretty good, pretty uh, nice terrain. You can see lots of different features like lakes, different biomes like forests, deserts, uh, mountains. It looks, it looks um, not totally realistic, but it looks nice. And looking at our kids playing this and looking at this landscape, we started wondering if we could build up a realistic mines, uh, landscape in Minecraft using our own data. And that was the spark of the idea. So what would happen if we could put our own real geodata into Minecraft? Um, suddenly we would have a high performance and very intuitive 3D GIS system. And most importantly, we would have a user base much larger than any other GIS system. Furthermore, we could reach out to a whole new group of users, uh, children, people who don't usually use GIS software. Uh, as you saw, there are millions of people playing Minecraft at any given point in time. I I guess there might be a few hundreds using GIS software at any given point in time. 
And we could also see lots of possible applications, like in education was, uh, was a, is a good example, learning about geography, mathematics, uh, all kinds of things. But there's also citizen involvement. If people could interact with uh, their own local geography, uh, that could be usual, uh, useful feedback to planners, for example, if something new was, was to be built. We also thought about using this as a data validation and quality control tool, and perhaps also for data processing. That was part of the original I idea to put our height model into Minecraft, look at it, walk around in it, and see if we could spot errors. That's not the main application, but it's, it should be possible to, to use it for that. But then came the interesting question. Do we have data of a good enough quality to build a virtual world that looks real? And we set out to, to examine that problem. So, and in the beginning, it was just Torbjorn and I, the two of us, uh, doing this in our spare time. Uh, we thought it was an interesting idea, and we had to pursue it. Our team leader, Nune, was doing promotion internally in the Geodata Agency, meanwhile. And a lot of people thought that this was a good idea, and it, it caught on pretty quickly and was formalized as a project. And uh, the project chose to have focus on applications in education and, of course, uh, as a showcase for what you can do with these open data. Uh, we will mention some of the challenges we had to overcome in, uh, in this process. We, we have to map the, the curved ellipsoidal Earth into a kind of flat 3D Minecraft coordinate system. And also our geodata could come from various different projections. So we had to um, develop a transformation from our usual coordinate systems into a Minecraft coordinate system. It was actually a pretty simple one we came up with, but we, we came up with a transformation, and meaning this means that you can take a GPS coordinate, for example, perform a couple of transformations, and end up with the corresponding point in our Minecraft world. So there should be applications of that also. Um, there were also problems with data sets captured at different times. So there had to we had to perform some data assimilation. Like here's, here's an example of uh, one layer showing where beaches are and the height map, the height, the terrain layer not matching that. So you see the beach crawling up uphill. Actually, this hill had, had collapsed after the height uh, model was captured. So we had to do a lot of uh, assimilation and sometimes just say, well, that's the way data is. So, we can see the differences. Yes. As for processing of this uh, data set, um, the entire data set is 4 times 10 to the power of 12 blocks. Then we get little, in Denmark, it is 4,000 billion blocks. We don't have trillion in our language, so it's 4 trillion blocks in, in American terms. Um, and we had to, 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 um, to uh, the issue we had, we, this, this was the, the tool we had, uh, a standard government issue laptop. It's not really high performance. So we had to, to, to design an algorithm that could process this huge amount of data on standard office laptop. Luckily, it runs Microsoft Windows 7, so we uh, will help there. Um, we, um, we had this uh, algorithm that took uh, from, we, we designed a database where we put everything into uh, and compiled the data and this algorithm spit out one 10 kilometer zip file. That would take this laptop two hours to do that. But then we scaled up, we just added laptops um, and then we, um, we could run in parallel. But to keep track of it, we had to add a layer to our database, uh, a spatial layer. Uh, so this is uh, a map. This is it's our world, so <laughs> we know maps. And using a map to, to keep track of this processing, that was 
easy to do. Um, so basically, the database would um, would would uh, keep track of, of pending tasks and active tasks and which laptops have underperformed, uh, could we push more jobs to another laptop, we would do that. So this was very much scalable. Um, this was something that we didn't intend when we started the project, but it became necessary. And now this is something we use for other heavy tasks uh, when we have them. Uh, so, so this idea of having a database controlling processing we could, w when we had this, we could we could uh, prioritize the, the major cities, Aarhus, Aalborg, Odense, for instance, and Copenhagen, because we wanted to see the result of these calculations before we wanted to see the open countryside. So, uh, very helpful. Um, as of the modeling, as Simon mentioned, we had these biomes, forest and heather and whatever, and we also had similar features in our map data which we could translate into a Microsoft, uh, sorry, sorry, Minecraft uh, biome. Um, then we had uh, more regular features like a, a, a fence, a traffic fence, a wind turbine that had to be modeled in a certain manner. Um, and then we had special features which required a little bit more intelligence. For instance, buildings, they consist of four walls and a roof and windows, a railroad that needs to be a network so you can actually put a a cart on it and travel along the railroad. And and each of these features had their own uh, char characteristics, so they had to be modeled uh, in their own way. So <coughs> yeah, I'll just show a few uh, steps in the development from the very primitive first Hello World example in the upper left corner. Just uh, a height map uh, put into Minecraft. That was kind of our proof of concept. We could do this and then it was just a matter of adding layers. So uh, to the right of that, we <laughs> put houses into the model. It didn't look very good, so we had to do something else. We went further, experimented with different textures and uh, uh, both for walls and, and rooftops. Um, in the end, we ended up with random colors because we didn't really have data to to tell us which colors, which textures the houses had. They were not available in the open data. So it would be decided it would be better with just random colors. So after a lot of trial and error, we ended up with something like this. Uh, this is part of the city of Aarhus from a place called Risco near the harbor. And uh, you see a lot of the feature types that we have in the model. Uh, to the right, we have a forest. Uh, it's not the trees uh, have not been uh, have not grown up yet. We just planted them. In Minecraft, you can plant trees. We did that in our program, and they will grow up eventually. You see roads, um, and you see actually a part of a railroad here. We had lamp posts. Uh, of course, the houses with flat roofs. We didn't have data to tell us the exact three-dimensional structure of the of the rooftops in in our data set. They are available in some other data sets which are not free. Um, also, we can s we have some land use information. Like we know that down here, this is an industrial area, so we could map the texture in a in a special way according to the land use. So, and we had to stop somewhere. We could have put more features into it, but at this point, we were satisfied. So this might be hard to see, but this is just an image from Bonholm of the completely raw model, just a height map with uh, a forest area and a stream crossing through it. And it actually looks pretty good, we, we thought. Uh, it's really the height variation that, that makes the difference here. That's the basic the fundamental data layer, which is also s pinpointed here at Moons Klint, which is not a mountain, but uh, a high cliff in Denmark with uh, approximately 100 meters from bottom to top, uh, right out to the ocean. That's one of the places that, that look impressive. We also model that um, uh, stuff over 100 meters would get snow cover when, when uh, we had downfall. So you can see there's no piling up on top of that. Yeah. 
let's try a live demo and let's hope that it works then. So if you're not uh, familiar with, with Minecraft, you, there's a launcher which, yeah, you launch the, the a Java uh, program. And uh, should we say a server? Let's go say yeah. whatever. Yeah, let's do that. We have a small demo server running uh, at the Geodata agency nowadays. We had three live servers, but they closed the scheduled the 24th October, I think it was. So here we are. Um, anywhere we should go? Opal, so you say. Opal, SOE. Yeah, here we are. Let's just jump down here. <coughs> this is not a high performance server, so it might be a bit laggy. Um, yeah, and it's hard to see anything. It's a bit too dark. But if you fly up a bit, this is part of Bornholm, um, where you see footpaths going into the hills. And also we try to include a little bit of fictive, more or less fictive geology. Like we know that the terrain is rocky on Bornholm, so we put rocks in the underground and other places we put clay. We also put various minerals in the underground by some random algorithms. Uh, <coughs> this is actually a forest area and the forests are just planted so they will grow up eventually as people wander around, but not very many people <laughs> wander around on this server. Now we're in an urban environment. This is the city of Aarhus. And this is as when most people look at Minecraft, it is blocky. It, is, it looks like something out of the 80s when you were playing with a Commodore 64 or Nintendo or something. So everything can look a bit um, the same. But to help the, uh, the users, we, we had uh, small addresses added to each building so that they could find their way around. You can actually, all the addresses in Denmark are, are in this, uh, this server here. So, uh, I could, but I would don't have a warp to it, so we'd have to search for it. And uh, there's a pretty good um, chance that it doesn't look very good because our data from Copenhagen were hmm. of a different quality. So we had to interpolate house building heights. Yeah. So now we're in Copenhagen anywhere, somewhere. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where it is, but then again, the, the, the address signs will help us a bit. So we can see that this is uh, Tornebuskegade. We so used to have an online map which could would tell track. us where, where we were, but uh, that's not online anymore. No, this is, I think, is uh, Nørreport. So this is the, the, the station that is being rebuilt at the moment, or has been rebuilt, Nørreport station. So this doesn't really look like this anymore. Uh, we should be able to find the uh, the round tower uh, one of down one of these uh, streets here. Um, I'm not so familiar with with downtown Copenhagen. I'm from Jutland, different part of Denmark. So, <laughs> but yeah, this is the I think this is Wolfhulkirke. This is a, a church where the crown prince and princess were were married actually, and it doesn't really look much like that building, but. Uh, but then again, we have the outline, we have an approximate height of the building, uh, so... And then Ronetorn would be down here. It is, of course, possible to do much more modeling to the, to the houses to go. get them to look right in 3D, but you need no other data sets to, to do that. We have also done that on, in different projects. So, yeah. And one of the things that we should also outline with, with Minecraft is that everything is interactive. I can dig a hole in the ground and I can, uh, I can build something instead of what I've just uh, uh, destroyed here. Build my own house if I want. So, yeah. Oh, back here. Yeah, so um, we launched the project on April 24. Um, and immediately, right at the same day, it was there was a huge media response. Somehow, oh. this um, 
this news went viral and a lot of media covered the story and contacted us and that of course meant that a lot of people were wanted to get into our service and our service and our the admins that means the two of us had a really hard time keeping up and it actually evolved into an arms race with so-called griefers that's minecraft slang for people with destructive in-game behavior that could be just destroying things like you see here at um, the central station in Copenhagen, which became quite a battle area, actually. We could easily restore everything just with a single command, but that would also destroy what people had, had built. So we tried not to do that too often. But they also tried to uh, more tricky things like crashing the servers by filling up uh, RAM or overloading CPU usage. One strategy to do that could be to build a huge machine. In Minecraft, you can build machines and you can uh, connect them by redstone wires, they're called, so they can do perform stuff. And that, of course, takes a lot of CPU time. So these guys were building a huge door factory with thousands and thousands of doors, which was just open and closed. And that will produce sound and that will uh, take a lot of CPU time. And then they would cover up these machines and hit, hide them underground so we couldn't see them. And s the servers would just start to lag until we discovered where they were and could, could uh, stop the machines. So that was one strategy to, to just lag the servers. But after a few days and a lot of mistakes, we were quite naive as server admins. We got things pretty much under control. Um, we had closed down all, all the nasty things that people could do. And uh, people s then started to kind of move into the model and live inside it like it was a virtual or like it was a virtual world. So they mo moved, moved in, into their own houses perhaps, but most of, all f most of all people from all over the world started to build wonderful and weird things in collaboration. So our geodata kind of evolved into a social media where people were hanging out. So we'll show some examples of what was built inside our, our servers. This is Amalienborg uh, Castle, where the Queen's residence, where a single player, I think, built build up the square. It was later destroyed by griefers before we could protect it, actually. Um, a guy built Leergravsparken metro station um, to a pretty, a, a, a pretty um, good detail. So you can just take the next slide. He, he built the interior, uh, complete with trains running around the tracks uh, and everything. It was quite nice. We should maybe also mention that the trains would also cause server lag. So we, we were in a dilemma. We didn't want to, to, to allow too much lag, but we didn't want to exclude people from making stuff like this either. It would be a shame. So. Some players build uh, Kronborg Hamlet's castle. Uh, took them a couple of days, I think. And that was really impressive, with complete with interior decorations and the prisons underneath, uh, underneath the castle. A uh, few other, other examples. This is a town hall of a small town in uh, southern Sealand. Uh, some players hang, hang, hung out for a really long time and just built. Uh, but looking at this, I think you can start to, s to, to, s to see that it's actually possible to, to use this as a tool for city planning, for citizen involvement, for, for building something that looks real. Uh, I think this example really shows that. Just another example uh, of the so-called Flow Hotel, which was built in Copenhagen, where a group of players in collab collaboration built up a hotel, complete with rooms and cafeterias, and they collaborated uh, and worked in, in there and accepted guests. Uh, it was You could rent a room in this hotel, actually. <laughs> yeah. 
The ca cathedral of Roskilde was also built by a couple of players to a great detail. An H&M store somewhere, I don't know where, but complete with delivery trucks. And there are lots and lots and lots of examples like this. Uh, if if you travel around the backup that we have uh, of these servers, just around these 45,000 square kilometers, you can still find lots of strange things, strange things that people built during that period. And of course, a very popular thing to build was flags of various countries. That's a very common mi thing to do in Minecraft. Um, so, pretty nice. Yeah. The media response to this, uh, to this we uh, at the Geodata Agency, we had uh, a press release made um, that was scheduled to, to be sent out the afternoon when we opened for these servers. We were interviewed by this guy in uh, the Danish National Radio, and, and he publicized this article in the morning, and th that wasn't quite agreed on. But from there, it exploded, and this press release just became sort of, hmm, yeah, okay, nobody wanted to read it anyway. And and we got response from a lot of places. These were just some of those who reported on, on this uh, uh, event. Um, just taking some of these statements out, uh, Bloomberg compared it to Obamacare, which we think is a bit over the top, uh, because <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything like that at all. And building blocks and healthcare, mm, ah, not really. Um, and Gizmodo, they they said that it was to send a signal about transparency, and somehow it it may be true because we we use the same data to build this that anyone could could do. Anyone can do what we did. Um, and motherboard, they stated the obvious that geodata is fun. We knew that all along, and. Now, <laughs> someone else do as well. Um, what is more interesting, perhaps, is to see the user reactions. Because if, if you looked at this blocky thing and you hadn't learned about Minecraft before, you'd say it doesn't look anything like real life. And that may be true. But, but for those who are used to Minecraft, it, it, um, the, the level of abstraction was very easy to, to obtain. And they, they, uh, uh, that was quite some, some positive response in the various forums here. This was just s some of them. So, yeah. Yeah, we had approximately 37,000 unique visitors on the online service, but the data set is available for download. You can still download it from download code for streaming DK, um, or both as a per file download or, or as a mass download from FTP. Um, and it is used in education today, and, and there's still a lot to be done with these data. And we can see that. I'll just uh, we will just uh, round up with a video of of, uh, of one of the um, places it was used in the city of Albertslund. They they had a project with some kids, and it pretty much speaks for itself. This fall, the game workshop set out to investigate how the map of Denmark in Minecraft could be a platform for user involvement in urban planning. More precisely, the project aimed at involving children in creating a vision for the future of Albertslund. Our goal was to deliver a prototype of an educational design which was to be presented at a conference for policymakers. The challenge was to utilize the virtual urban space as an environment for children to present their ideas. This approach was developed further into a format that easily could be made accessible in an educational context. Our working title was Albertslund, the children's town, and we challenged ourselves to make urban planning into a game. In this phase, the game workshop experimented with urban planning in Minecraft and tested a game concept with primary school students from local schools. This process culminated in a workshop with a fifth grade class from a local school. The class was divided into six groups, each representing architect studios, competing to deliver the best proposal for a residential area. We chose an area which the municipality was developing to be the building site. 
Each studio was assigned an area and were commissioned to create 20 homes in that area. The first day's challenge was to create the buildings, to make room for the 20 homes and to organize them on the building site. Vi vi var inne med att det skulle vara sån en fyrkant men nu det blev sån lite skrot för vi hade inte så mycket plats att bygga på. The second day's work focused on the areas around the houses and solutions to making the area more appealing to children were created. Both days students were working towards a deadline after which the municipal director and mayor paid them a virtual visit at their construction sites. Ja, det går så bra. Det är mycket fint. Jag kan mycket gott lide den måten vi har fått natur och miljö in. The workshop ended with the declaring of the winning proposal. Yeah, and that pretty much concludes our presentation and thank you for your attention. Thanks.